Good morning. How are we doing? Everybody awake? Well, those of you that are here, right? It looks about 50% of the audience we had yesterday. Must have been a lot of late nights. All right. Well, thanks for coming. So I woke up this morning, and I was inspired uh, to change my entire talk. Um, largely because Bjorn from SAP yesterday had such a wonderful eye chart uh, of boxes and lines uh, that make up the, the cloud platform. So should we pull that slide up and maybe walk through box by box? Yeah? yeah? No, I'm just kidding. That, that... <laughs> um, I, I joke, but there's, there's a lot of complexity in, in Cloud Foundry. And so what I want to talk to you today about is the combination of the enterprise readiness of this open source project and the innovation that's happening both inside the project teams and around it in our ecosystem and our community. Now, I, I, I love starting talks with this you know, really simple slide. Right? So those of you that are developers, and hopefully about half of you are developers, you recognize this, right? Sort of a moment of anticipation. You wrote some code, you're ready to go, it's time to push it into the platform, and you know it's gonna be ready for production at that point. Well, assuming you don't have any bugs. It's a moment for a developer where you get to be free to release the software quickly. And Ansi from, from Pivotal a while back wrote this awesome haiku. Here's my source code, run it on the cloud for me, I do not care how. And there's a lot behind that promise. So let's spend some time digging in underneath it. Now, I was in enterprise technology as a buyer for many, many, many years. And there's one thing that I know that enterprise ready means. It means there's a sales guy with a quote who wants me to sign. But I, I kid, and all of the account executives in the room, I'm not talking about you if you're you know, talking about Cloud Foundry, of course, right? This is enterprise ready software. So what, is, what does enterprise ready mean for the Cloud Foundry ecosystem? It really boils down to four key attributes, and these are the themes that we're gonna talk about today. The first is secure. Cloud Foundry is being used in some of the most highly secure IT environments globally. Second, well integrated, right? Because an application on its own is fairly useless. You need great backing services, you need integration into the quote unquote legacy IT systems, and I hate that, I hate that term. Um, what is legacy but the thing that you already pushed to production yesterday, right? Being well integrated. Third, scalable, right? Because we're, not only are we being used heavily by large enterprises, I mean, you heard the numbers from Comcast yesterday, we're being used by large scale public cloud providers to offer has, so it needs to scale. And last, but not least, is that great developer experience, and that includes integration with IDEs, that includes integration with developer workflows. So this is, this is what enterprise ready means to Cloud Foundry ecosystem. Now, I, I was a web developer, but, but if you imagine you're a user and you don't know much about how technology is built, you know, when you think about, is this app that I'm using secure? Really, it comes down to this simple little icon that shows up in your browser, right? You're like, oh yeah, sure. They must be a secure app. But we all know that there's a lot more behind that. And if we dig into what Cloud Foundry is, we've got this control plane with lots and lots of components, and they're all talking to each other, and there's lots of communication going on, and we've got all the applications being deployed. They're talking to the components underneath it. They're talking to each other. There's a lot of communication paths that have to be secured. So our community's been doing two things. So the first is that they've been going through each one of the components that make up our control plane, and ensuring that the communications from each component whether it's one of our services like UAA to the cloud controller, or whether it's the cloud controller to its database, is secure, so that we can be trusted to run in public environments. The second thing that's been happening is a lot of innovation around how do you secure the applications themselves, make it really easy for a developer to secure communication between their two microservices. So we've got a lot of great stuff happening there. And we're about 90% of the way there in terms of the control plane. At least that's the latest number that uh, Yui Cal gave me. So, I think we're close to being completely encrypted in all our internal communications. And if we dig a little bit deeper into the platform, we, we go into a single Diego cell. We run into Garden. This is the lowest level container abstraction in, inside our platform. Now, our, I love our Garden team because they've, they've really made it their mission, and it's a lofty goal. Their mission is to be the most secure container runtime for a multi-tenant application platform in the industry. 
Now, it's a great goal. And they spent a lot of effort adopting Run C. This is a place where our collaboration with another open source ecosystem comes to bear. Run C is the project that came from Docker, was brought to the Open Container Initiative, and it, along with the Open Container uh, image format specification, represent the building blocks for container-based platforms. And our garden team is focused on security, so they've, of course, used C groups for resource, uh, resource constraints, but app armor, username spacing, and set comp are all enabled by default. These are really important kernel features that allow us to have a robust isolation between the different containers running in the system. So now I want to step back a little bit and talk about a project called CredHub. Some of you might have heard of CredHub. It's an incubating project. It recently you know, joined the foundation. Um, CredHub is, is solving a problem that emerges when you're dealing with these complex distributed systems, and it, I think it solves it very elegantly. It thinks about credentials, really with four pillars. What are the things we need to do with any credential? We need to be able to generate new ones. We need to be able to, of course, encrypt it, both for in transit as well as at rest. We need to be able to persist it. And we want to make rotation really easy. And we want to expose that through policy and make it an option for admins to use, the apps themselves to use, and the infrastructure to use. There's a really great example of the applications themselves. Uh, our, our Diego team has been integrating CredHub, and what, what they've done is they've said every application instance running on a Diego cell could potentially have its own unique certificate, which would not only identify the instance or the container, but also allow it to naturally secure its communication with all of the other app instances or micro other microservices that it might be using. All right, so in, in the software industry, we, we really know one thing about software quality, and that's the number of bugs that any software has, right? Uh, that equation's n plus one, where n equals the number of bugs you currently know about. And, uh, of course, some of those bugs are going to be vulnerabilities. This is just the reality of complex software. Um, software is difficult to build. We do our best to have secure coding practices, but open source software, proprietary software, there's a constant stream of new fixes that need to be rolled out into environments. So imagine for a second, you were going to go build a system just like Cloud Foundry yourself, not by using Cloud Foundry, but by building all of the pieces and parts necessary to create this level of a platform you'd probably start first by picking an operating system. Now, they have a constant stream of vulnerabilities, and I'd argue, having done this at a managed service provider, we still really haven't figured out as an IT industry how to effectively patch manage at scale uh, diverse operating systems. Then you start building up a whole bunch more dependencies, right? Databases, message brokers. You've got the programming language that your developers are using and the frameworks, things like Node.js or the Spring framework. And last, you've got the platform itself, whether that's a combination of open source software you've pulled together or whether it's a bunch of Python scripts that somehow deploy applications and manage them. There's a lot of risk in a platform like this. Now, what the Cloud Foundry open source community does for the entire ecosystem is bring a level of maturity that is really unparalleled in open source software. We release an entire platform from a base operating system all the way up to the build packs that support the custom apps that are being deployed. This is incredibly important to our ecosystem. All of the downstream distributions get the value of it, and all of the direct open source users get the same value. And we do it at a high velocity, too. Our coordinated releases are averaging over twice a month, and they can be kicked out extremely rapidly. Has anybody here heard of cloud.gov? Yeah, a few of you. So we, we talk about it periodically at, at conferences. They've, they've given, um, given talks, I, I think, in one of our events in Berlin. Cloud.gov is an online service that was created by a group inside the US federal government called 18F. 18F's entire job is to find ways to allow technology and some of the learnings we have around how you develop software, more agile techniques, DevOps practices, how to, how to support that learning and support the adoption of technology that's much more modern in all the government departments, agencies, bureaus, whoever's interested. And so they launched cloud.gov. It's a pure open source implementation of Cloud Foundry, um, including backing services. But what's really cool about it is that in order to be effectively adopted across the federal government, they had to get what's called a FedRAMP authorization. Now, that may be a very boring bureaucratic, bureaucratic term, but if anybody here has done any government work, 
you understand that that federal authorization is exceptionally hard to get. In February of this year, they received that authorization and became the first open source service to get FedRAMP authorization. Now, they did that, and I look at that and say, that's a sign of the open source upstream demonstrating the quality and its enterprise readiness, number one. But number two, they did it in an extremely transparent way. So if you're in a different industry, financial services, insurance, manufacturing, you have your own regulatory scheme that you need to worry about. You can go find 18F's public documents that talk about how they deployed Cloud Foundry, how they operated, how those procedures and technologies map to their controls. So go take a look. It's, it's an amazing uh, example of, uh, of governments finding a way to be participants in the open source world, but also build up the possibility of better citizen engagement. All right, so let's transition to scale. Now, oh, there are also mics over there. 250,000 application instances. That's containers, for those of you that want to hear that word. Late last year, the Diego team reached the quarter million containers being deployed and managed by the Cloud Foundry platform. But see, here's the thing. It wasn't a false test. This was a realistic performance and scale test. It included applications of varying sizes. It also included applications that were purposefully designed to inject fault, to shut themselves down. That demonstrated that the system continued to keep its promise of the apps staying alive. It demonstrated that we could drive massive throughput through the system. And it also gave us some opportunities for additional improvement. Now I'm gonna pick on one team, mostly because they did really great work. Our routing tier is part of the data path. As a user of an application, when I make a request via my web browser, it's gonna flow through the system. The first thing it's gonna hit is the routing tier. So obviously, throughput's really important. Before they started their performance work, the team, pay attention to the five millisecond latency and throughput intersection. Um, the team measured and baselined at about 1,000 uh, requests per second as throughput for an instance. They spent one release and managed to improve that all the way up to over three times the throughput. Now that's good and that's impressive and it was amazing work, but here's what's more important. Every single release they rerun the test and look for continued incremental improvement to the scale. Now that is an incredibly mature open source project. Now I love this image. So those of you that might work in, in the Cloud Foundry upstream, you probably recognize it. The, the team uh, was really looking forward to retiring the older DEA architecture, and they actually had a countdown timer. Of course, this was a CF-deployed application, right? And they had a countdown timer that counted down the, the minutes and seconds until we got to move the older architecture to the attic. So make no mistake, the DEAs are dead. Well, they'll live on forever in read-only mode. Um, but the entire ecosystem has transitioned to the Diego architecture. Now, let's, let's talk about Cloud Foundry Platform Certification. You notice I've got the year 2016 up there. Because in, in December of, of 2015, we announced platform certification, and we had a really lofty goal. Our goal was to find a way to help ensure that the downstream distributions and services based on Cloud Foundry were gonna provide consistency so that we could have application and skill portability across the distributions and throughout the ecosystem. Now, it's a bit of a lofty goal. We did not fully achieve it that year. We did launch the program and it was successful. But fast forward to 2017 and we've done a few things. So first, the 2017 certification has eliminated the option for the older architecture, we're Diego only, and the whole ecosystem's moved there. Two, we've also decreased the age that a distribution that's certified can use from something as old as a year back to less than six months. So now we're moving the entire ecosystem together forward, release by release. The second thing we did, though, is to talk about application portability, you know, the, the area of differentiation that the distros have is in the services, along with a bunch of other wonderful things. But, you know, the core platform is the same. It's really about the service capabilities. So when we launched the Open Service Broker API initiative, that was designed to open up and free the services so that we could have a much more fluid service marketplace, so that a cloud provider A could offer their services to CF platforms that may or may not be running in their environment. That's been successful, and it's actually been successful across ecosystems. 
And then, of course, as Abby mentioned, we launched our Cloud Foundry Certified Developer Program, and that really was not possible without getting ecosystem consistency. So we build off of this platform certification as a community. And our training portfolio has grown dramatically. We, we have been doing one-day summit training classes since the, the foundation started. And I want to thank all of the, the partner companies who have actually delivered that training and have created it, um, and, and Cloud Credo and Pivotal specifically for open sourcing some of those courses for us. But we also launched the Introduction to Cloud Foundry class in the edX platform. A team, wonderful team from Stark and Wayne worked really hard to get that done under a tight deadline. We launched it, and it's been a great success. It sits there in, in the edX platform right next to courses from MIT, Stanford, Harvard. It's a great audience to have. Cloud Foundry for Developers. Now, this is the much more intense class. It's designed to be delivered really two ways. One, we're offering it in partnership with the Linux Foundation as e-learning material. But two, we have over 13 and growing authorized training partners that are ready to deliver this material. It's common, it's multi-vendor, it works across the distributions, and it's a great baseline for all of the, the different vendors in our ecosystem to build off of. And then, of course, last but not least, the Cloud Foundry certified developers also uh, is also useful across the entire ecosystem. Now, I'm, I'm really happy to say that we had a soft launch of that, that program, and we've already educated over 5,000 developers in less than three months without doing a ton of marketing. That's great, but it's just the start. Okay, so let's transition now. I want to talk a little bit about innovation. Now, innovation, Cloud Foundry, comes from a number of different sources. Um, we, of course, have uh, the Cloud Foundry community itself, but we're deeply intertwined working with other open source ecosystems, everything from the Open Container Initiative with both their, their uh, image specification, the Run-C library. Um, we've been actively working, our, our Diego Persistence Project, who's been finding ways to provide attached storage to the containers, have been working deeply with other platforms to think about what does it mean to do volume management in a container system. Open tracing. Open tracing is a very important CNCF project as well. We can initiate Zipkin traces, which is based on the open tracing API, directly from a router all the way down through microservices. CNCF container networking interface, which I'm actually, I'd like to make sure that everybody saw the announcement. Our container to container networking project reached its 1.0 milestone just a few days ago. So if your distribution offers it, give it a try. If you're using the open source directly, give it a try. If your distro doesn't offer it, feel free to ask them for it, because it really is a great capability for the application developers. Now, Abby introduced that Microsoft has joined us. I, I just want to spend a minute to talk about the Microsoft t technology and how we think about it uh, related to Cloud Foundry. So in 2015, we, we spent a lot of time talking about how the, the Microsoft technology stack, and .NET in particular, but also the Windows operating system, was really important, right? If you sort of squint, you see that there's, there's roughly, you know, when, when enterprise software is being built, a large percentage of it is Java, and another large percentage of it is .NET. So the Microsoft technology stack is incredibly important to, to true enterprise adoption. Now, there's the Iron Foundry project, which was really the first effort, and I think a few of those folks are here, right, years ago. It was the first effort to do .NET services on the Windows operating system within the context of Cloud Foundry. And we've evolved it. We have production systems that are running .NET workloads on Microsoft Windows. Now, when Microsoft released the .NET language as open source software, that also allowed us to then say, great, let's have a .NET core build pack for the Linux platform. And that's available, and that's, that's being provided in the upstream at the same level of parity as all of the others. But we also, this year, have unlocked the power of Bosch for the Windows platform. The Bosch Windows project team has launched you know, the initial release. You could now get all the same operational value you get from managing Linux nodes, Linux-based distributed systems, using Windows-based distributed systems. And the last thing I'll point out on Microsoft was, uh, I think Corey mentioned this very briefly yesterday, the, the CF command line tool, and this is really neat, the CF command line tool is now installed by default in the Azure cloud shell. That makes it really easy for a developer using the Azure platform to get access to Cloud Foundry. They can, I think, one-click deploy CF, and then the command line's already installed in the cloud shell. It makes it really easy. So, so let's go back to this whole CF push thing. I've actually heard um, from you know, plenty of end users, and in particular developers, that, that we do actually have some improvement that we need to make to this. 
And the improvement is, is in the flow of a developer. Now, for those of you that write code, you know that there's, there's a flow that you have local to your machine. You know, you're, you're local on your laptop, you're doing a lot of tests and you know, debugging, and you're kind of, you're looping, you're looping. And even though CF push is extremely easy and gets you all the value of the, you know, knowing that it's gonna be well operated, that CF push process is a little bit slow for local development. So Stephen Levine, our BuildPacks project manager, or product manager, he created on his own time a really neat project. So everybody should go check this out. It's called CF Local. CF Local uses the Docker container engine, local to a laptop, and it lets you do a stage. That means build a container using a build pack. It lets you run that container locally. And the really interesting thing here is that you can bind local database services to that instance so it looks and feels like it's running in the larger CF platform, or you can connect to a remote Cloud Foundry environment and proxy in the service instances that have been created for you. You can also push and pull images, so a lot of possibility here. And he, I know he's got a really interesting uh, um, uh, set of potential futures for this project. I encourage you to talk to him. There's, a, there's an office hours uh, that's dedicated to this particular project. So take the time, go, go learn about it. It's got a great future for us. Now completely orthogonal, let's talk about something that isn't containers. Um, there's a possibility, possibility, that unikernels might be an interesting alternative deployment model in the future. Um, there was a project that was created at Dell EMC called Unique. It's an orchestration platform for unikernel-based systems. And it's been proposed to join the Cloud Foundry Foundation. So pay attention to that. Engage in the conversation about whether it's a fit. We're excited that it's, uh, at least the, that community, uh, which is already fairly diverse, has expressed interest in joining us. Okay, so I'm well over time. The countdown clock is actually going up, but that's okay. <laughs> this is a lot of really interesting stuff, at least to me. So I want to say happy birthday to Bosch. Can we take a few minutes to sing happy birthday? No, no, we don't, don't really need to do that. But Bosch is five years old. Five years old. Um, and it's undergone an enormous amount of change. In particular, over the course of the last year, it's gone through a set of changes that have been kind of termed Bosch 2.0. Now, we haven't released Bosch 2.0, but they've been termed Bosch 2.0 because they've reduced the complexity of building Bosch releases. They've reduced the complexity of deploying and managing environments using the Bosch platform. So a lot of really great changes. And that's why we believe the Kubo project, which Abby introduced yesterday, is so interesting. Because it's another demonstration of a complex distributed system, a platform focused on containers, being managed by Bosch. All right, so, so what deploys your platform? That's a question you should ask. Well, it turns out Bosch is the right answer for that. But also, Bosch is the multi-cloud story for Cloud Foundry. Make no mistake about it, it's at the heart of it. When we talk about multi-cloud, and all of the cloud provider interfaces that are supported by the upstream, it's a wide variety. We range from large-scale uh, large public clouds through to open source platforms like OpenStack, the, the on-premise software coming out of VMware with Photon and vSphere. Um, don't forget, of course, Bluemix SoftLayer, and then even bare metal provisioning systems like RackHD. It's a wide range of options supported by the upstream community. And in addition, there are further CPIs that are out there for, for other cloud providers or, or infrastructure options out in the open source community. But multi-cloud isn't just about our CPIs. It's actually, it's about how do you ensure that the capabilities of these different public clouds are exposed in a way that can be used by developers and used by the platform. So there's two other areas that I'll highlight. The first is that the UAA module with its identity providers has added both Google and Microsoft identity providers. That's kind of neat, right? So if you use Google Apps in your enterprise, you can tie that into your cloud platform. The other is the Open Service Broker API. Now, I've mentioned this three times. This is the third time. There's a reason for that. This is an important project. It allows Microsoft, it allows Google, it allows Fujitsu to describe their cloud services in a way that can be consumed by other platforms whether that's Cloud Foundry, or whether that's Kubernetes, or whether that's any of the products that are building on top of Kubernetes or any other platform. It's extremely powerful. Nice and simple, but extremely powerful. Um, and I have the pleasure of actually announcing today that as of at some point really early this morning, uh, the, the project team, the cross-ecosystem project team, has their first release of the specification that's not intrinsically and directly tied to the Cloud Foundry platform release. 
So huge uh, um, hat tip to that, that group. It's an amazing job. And we're seeing it be adopted in the Kubernetes community, and it's wonderful. It provides all kinds of flexibility for users. So with that, I'm, I'm, I'm done mostly talking to you, and I actually want to introduce a few people up to the stage. We're going we're gonna to have a conversation for a few minutes here. Um, so I want to bring up first uh, Frederick from TechCrunch, who's going to help moderate a conversation. There he is. All right, Frederick. And then we've got KY from Microsoft and Eric Johnson from Google Cloud. <laughs> 